All right, welcome back, if you're still interested. Um, the last case study I want to speak about in this set of modules is something we've termed holistic reaction analysis. And so in, in short, what we wanted to do when we started in this project, and this is work done by Jolyn Reed, who's now a professor at UBC, was to data mine a class of reactions, one that has been well studied. Um, in this case, we're gonna talk to you a little bit about the addition of nucleophiles to amines. Um, and in this class of, of reactions, there are a number of chiral catalysts that will promote this. And, and this is for a number of reasons. These products are generally of interest to synthetic chemists, but also it's a proving ground often for new catalyst design. Um, we chose within this um, subclass of reactions, the phosphoric acid catalyst, which is an acid catalyst, which will protonate the amine to make an aminium. Um, and ultimately that is what undergoes in an IM pair form, um, the enantioselective nucleophilic addition. We then took all of the reaction components and featureized them. That would be the solvents, the imines, the nucleophiles, and built a, regre a regression model that I'll speak about in more detail. Now, the ultimate goal of this is twofold, as many of our projects have involved in them. One of them is to do what is called out of sample prediction. And that would be, could we take unique examples of phosphoric acids, unique examples of imines, and unique examples of nucleophiles and match them to the right conditions and predict the reaction outcome? So that's a fairly big uh, picture uh, goal in terms of, let's say, you want to run this reaction in an industrial setting or for a total synthesis. The next one is to have a sense of what is important. This is, again, back to the idea of transfer learning. What is important mechanistically and get general concepts that may fall out of this type of analysis. So as a first step in this, what Jolene had to do is to assimilate all of the data associated with the goal of this project. Again, this is limited only to phosphoric acids, but as you can see, there are more than 300 reactions that we were able to data mine. And the way she data mined this was not only from the um, optimization studies, but also from the substrate scope that was produced in many of these uh, um, analyses. And so there are a lot of different variables here. And uh, again, there's some weird uh, PDF uh, conversion issues here, but essentially you can look at the diversity of the imines, the nucleophiles, the catalyst was probably the least diverse and the conditions. And so when we inventory this, what I should note is that the E and Z imines are both active forms of this. And we were able to classify this in our um, fits that I'll come back to in a second. There are 150 different imines evaluated. Mainly this is because people evaluated the imines um, as a way to optimize the reaction. There are now close to 80 nucleophiles that have been evaluated, only 17 catalysts, and that's partially because the synthetic synthesis of these catalysts, which is done through a cross coupling here, is generally very restrictive. Um, there were 12 different solvents, and this also included temperature, additives, and concentration. And what's nice, as I'll show you on the next slide is the way we can featureize these um, to take care of them. Um, I'm gonna briefly just show you, this is the data sources that we used. Um, the slide deck will be available for those interested. Um, there's some who's who in asymmetric catalysis, John Antilla, who's one of the real um, drivers of this area, Dave McMillan's in here, Akiyama, and a number of other very important people. I think Ben List is gonna be an example I'll show you a little later. All right, so how do you featureize? And so unlike the last module where the featureization was rather straightforward, featureization here is very complicated. So one of the important concepts and philosophies that we have in the group is how do you find overlapping features that have physical meaning? And so for, for imines is, is just an example you have E and Z imines, so we actually, we will, um, in this example, we will show you that we will featureize both um, isomers because we both are in fact involved in this type of asymmetric catalysis. And we use the aminium, and the reason we use the aminium is the proton itself, um, its charge can be a feature. The nitrogen, 
the carbonyl stretching frequency, the differential size of these groups, all can be features. Similarly, with a nucleophile, there's actually less features that are overlapping, only 14 here. Um, we looked at a number of features, including MBO charges, vibrations, MOs, size descriptors. But what you're going to find is this angle here comes out in some of our models. And this is this basically a classification of linear versus bent nucleophiles. We have many, many features of these catalysts. Part of this is our work with Dean Tost. Um, through the years, we have been looking into this area of asymmetric catalysis. And also Jolene, as part of her PhD work before she joined my lab, was an absolute expert in understanding the, the features of um, these catalysts. And she, showed, she introduced some new parameters that we hadn't used previously. And then finally, conditions. By far the most, I would say, difficult to give you physical meaning based on um, conditions. So we used a combination of DFT, quantitative structure, um, activity relationship um, tools, molecular mechanics, semi-empirical, essentially the kitchen sink. Um, and you'll see that uh, very few of these are actually important for asymmetric catalysis in these reactions at least. What's nice is temperature is already counted for and how you compute delta delta G double dagger. This is the like enantioselectivity, which is temperature dependent. We actually enter the concentration if available numerically. And additives, we um, I'll categorize these as ones or zeros. So let's say molecular sieves are in there to dehydrate the reaction. We call that a one. If it doesn't have it in it, we give it a zero. So ultimately we take all of this information, all of these features and we regress. And the regression takes quite some time and takes over the weekend um, because there's so many features. And we get what is a very complex multivariate linear regression um, output. Um, and I'll do a little digression on this, although that is probably something that we would have to talk about in person if you wanted to reach out to me. So first of all, let me talk about the stats. Again, this has been introduced in some of our other videos, but just for a very quick refresher, um, the R squared is relatively high, but this is obviously related to the number of samples we're able to do, do here. We do leave one out. I should note this is a 50-50 training set validation set split. Our K fold looks good and the predicted R squared is good as well. And this is not surprising. A lot of data here is a very good fit. Um, and what this suggests, this first off, is that um, the, the nature of asymmetric catalysis, the origin of asymmetric catalysis, is rather similar in all of these reactions. There's certainly going to be outliers here. We don't look into that too much. One other validation we do, which I think is really interesting, is we do something called leave reaction out prediction. Um, and so we leave seven reactions out. And the way we define reactions are separate publications. So this is done by publication source. And if you take seven publications out, you can see you can still regress with the same equation, uh, or you can re-regress and predict seven different reactions um, that were published. Again, what this suggests, these reactions are interrelated. Um, and that's one of the hypotheses we went in with uh, when we uh, set up this project. Now I'll digress a little bit about the parameters involved. This is actually very complicated, but what's really interesting to me at the get-go is catalyst features are not that important here. And that's partially because the catalyst isn't that diverse. Okay, so what's really diverse are the imines. And what this, these two parameters actually do is they classify whether it's an E or Z pathway. And you'll see that on the next slide a little bit more. And again, I already mentioned this, but we have this displaced versus linear, and that's another classification. So this model, by virtue of, of the parameters that we're using, is very general, very general, not very precise. Okay, and that's something to keep in mind. It's generalizing a lot of different information, but it's able to do this in a predictive manifold. What we can do next, and again, I won't spend a lot of time on these fits, but we can actually take the classification E versus E imine and re-regress on this um, and find different models. And what you're going to find in the, in the last bit of this um, module is we actually use this E and Z imine um, models to predict out of sample. They are more precise because they're looking at different mechanisms. And so just to kind of articulate that, 
what we can do is we can define very quickly whether the e-amine or z-amine mechanism is occurring. And by doing so, we can do predictions of new, exact, new substrate classes. So here's an example where we did not have this in our training set. This is a new catalyst, okay? We didn't have this type of imine, this alkynyl imine in our training set. And we did have, so we do have, this is included in our training set. We did have that in our training set, but taking two new components, we actually can predict with reasonably high um, prediction um, errors, um, 13 examples of a paper that was published just very recently in 2018, where we only get 2% um, error EE for 13 examples. So that's rather exciting. Um, I'm going to finish with probably the most important example of reaction prediction. And this is something I want to point you all to, is that Denmark published a rather beautiful study um, in 2019 using a, a really sophisticated um, set of tools, one to design the catalyst involved, one to um, then uh, uh, parameterize or featureize those the set catalysts, and then one to predict, and then using a um, supported vector machine algorithm, a much more sophisticated algorithm than I'm speaking about here today, to um, predict what is the best catalyst. And the best catalyst they predict is actually TCYP. Um, this is called TCYP. And what's interesting, I think, um, and, and what they did was look at a reaction initially published by Antilla. What's interesting just to point out is that in, we don't have TCYP in our training set. And the reason we don't have TCYP in our training set is the fact that TCYP was developed pretty much after all of those publications we used the trainer model. So TCYP is a newer um, catalyst. It's one that is used quite extensively now in the literature. And they find in their, in their predictions that TCYP is the best. And so what we did was to take the model I showed you previously and predict if um, our, our uh, correlation of all the literature data could predict the same outcome as those that found in the Denmark study. And indeed, what we find is our errors are rather uh, low, and I'll come back to that number in a second, and we can do this. And I just want to point out is we were able to use uh, data mining to get us there. Now, one thing I want to note here is this error is, is a little bit large, but I will um, note that the enantioselectivity is really high. And so at this high enantioselectivity, the difference between 99 and 98.5 is about 0.5 kcals per mole. So our model is predicting rather accurately at this high enantioselectivity level. And on that note, I am done uh, presenting this study and I hope you've enjoyed the three modules I've put together and I plan to build more in the future.